I should say that we're really lucky to have uh, Xu Xing uh, speaking here today. He's pop he is the uh, living extant uh, dinosaur paleontologist that has described the most species. More than 60, right? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> so uh, we're really lucky to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Jakob. And uh, thank you, Diego. I also want to thank uh, Emily and uh, Jakob for inviting me uh, to attend this meeting, uh, which is a wonderful meeting. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, so it's a long day, right? You must be very tired and uh, probably very hungry after listening to so many talks, although those talks are wonderful, interesting. So I will try to keep uh, <laughs> my talk uh, short as a as short as possible. Uh, so probably many of you heard uh, about this <laughs> transition, I mean, from dance to birth uh, already uh, many, many times, uh, used, like uh, talks, uh, books, uh, uh, you know, there's lots of wonderful fossils discovered over many, many years, especially last uh, three decades, four decades, uh, not only from like China, my home country, but also like from Argentina, Argentina, from North America, from Mongolia, from uh, uh, South Africa, I mean South Africa, so many, many places. So those fossils and their analyses improved greatly our understanding of this transition. So it's not possible for me to review all those uh, work and uh, progress uh, today. Uh, I'm going to focus on a few f uh, features uh, considered to be like uh, defining features for, for birds. Of course, the uh, two major features for birds are feathers and flight. And uh, there are many uh, discoveries recently uh, from China, from other countries. But the best place, of course, uh, I will say is, uh, is, uh, is from China. As you can tell, uh, there's a, uh, the, the fossil uh, producing area is, is not far from Beijing. Uh, it's quite a big area, actually. It's di distributed in three provinces, mainly in China, uh, eastern, uh, western Liaoning, uh, eastern part of uh, Inner Mongolia, and the northern part of uh, Hebei province. So this is the image of uh, Sinusoptics. Uh, uh, you, see this, uh, uh, you saw this minutes ago in a few talks. Uh, basically, the feathery dinosaur fossils were uh, recovered from two major layers. One is uh, the most fossils from, uh, from uh, what we call like a Zhuhe beds, which is like early Cretaceous, uh, or more accurately, it was about 160, uh, uh, 31 to 120 million years ago. Another major uh, fossil bearing beds are from Jurassic, we call Yan Liao beds. Uh, so you can tell from this image how we uh, collect the fossils and how we do, uh, do a field work in the, uh, this general area. So this uh, picture was taken uh, more than 20 years ago. So this is me <laughs> with red head. So this, this image shows how eager we want to find the fossils because you can see here the icicles overhanging the cliff. That's a winter time. It's very cold, but still we want to have some discoveries there because those things are so important for, for our research. And uh, here in Yanabati, you can see a few holes here, not dug by us, it's dug by local farmers. So not only scientists working there, but also lots of local farmers. Uh, so you can see uh, it's, uh, it's not an easy place to work because sometimes, you know, you see the, uh, the, uh, the layer is not very horizontal, it's oblique. So uh, working in that area, if you stay a really long time, you will get uh, like for example, back problem, uh, like myself. Uh, so, yeah, same. So this is me, uh, still handsome, all right, uh, young. Uh, so that's uh, uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, I will say uh, the reason that today we can talk about uh, the transition, we, today we, we have so, so good understanding of the transition, is it, uh, it's not just because of our hard working, it's also because some contribution from local farmers. So those farmers, you know, they live in there, they live there, they know their land very well. They actually, they also know the, 
the fossils uh, there very well. So they know exactly where the best fossils are from. And so they know exactly that which layer you can find a, a certain species. So uh, when we do field work there, we often talk to local farmers that get information about where to, to, to dig, uh, which layer we should uh, uh, spend more time, that kind of things. Uh, and also, those farmers can uh, also like collect lots of fossils. And uh, to be honest, uh, I will say the, the majority of uh, the published fossils are from the local farmers, uh, including a microraptor. You know, you see this. Uh, the, the, a few people mentioned this species already. Uh, so this is the very first microraptor fossil from the area, and actually, what it was it was also discovered and collected by a local farmer. And uh, now today, we have uh, many, many uh, fossils. You know, the minutes ago, Jim may highlighted uh, some uh, bird fossils. And from the same general area, you, you see thousands of uh, uh, feathery dinosaur fossils. Some are quite uh, small, uh, like, uh, early, uh, like other birds, but some can be very big. This, uh, you can see this is a feathery tyrannosaur. So this is a bike for scale. So there's a large animals, small animals. All, all, they are, all, all fossils are feathery. The best place, as Jim May mentioned earlier, uh, to study uh, early birds and uh, feathery dinosaurs are uh, this museum called Tianyu Nature History Museum, which is located in Shandong province, not in Liaoning. It's uh, in a, a kind of remote, a small county, but uh, it has amazing collection. You know, many, many beautiful and complete specimens. So with all these discoveries, all these fossils, now we have a very, very good understanding about uh, the, uh, the, the evolution of many bird features, for example, feathers. Uh, so uh, the fossils show that uh, uh, on the dancer bodies, uh, there are multiple, uh, there are many, many different types of fossils. I mean, different species have different fossils. The same species have different, fo different, uh, different feathers, just like uh, modern birds. And uh, if you map those morpho types on the tree, uh, what you can tell is uh, uh, they, they evolve from very simple forms to very complex forms toward the, uh, uh, the the genesis of birds. Uh, also, we are lucky these days because uh, uh, not only paleontologists are interested in this story, also like uh, development biologists, uh, they, they did lots of work over the last uh, uh, 10 years, 20 years. And now we have a very, very good understanding, for example, of, of, of uh, about like, a, for example, molecular pathway for many of the uh, major feather morphogenesis events. So we can combine the fossil data with the molecular data uh, to understand the, the, this evolution. Uh, today, I'm, we, I will just highlight uh, two uh, types of, basically there are two or three types of uh, feathers we found. So one is about like a fly feather, asymmetrical fly feathers. So uh, asymmetrical fly feathers, you see, uh, normally you see those feathers on the wings and the, and the tail is a defining feature actually, uh, not defining feature, just def defining feature for birds. Also uh, kind of often considered to be an uh, indicator for flight capability. So which, which is really, really important structure. And uh, surprisingly, about uh, 15 years ago, we found that uh, asymmetric fl flight feather in, in this dromaeosaur called Microraptor. So this is a, a close up of a feather at, uh, the, uh, clo uh, near the feet, uh, the uh, feet. So dinosaur have uh, asymmetric flight feathers, just like flying birds, which is surprising. But even more surprising is some recent discovery we made. For example, this species is called uh, Jia Nian Hua Long. So this is a beautiful skeleton. And if you look at closely the tail, uh, tail feathers, you see, although this Jia Nian Hua Long is not like a microbe has really, really long arms and other features indicating kind of uh, some kind of flight capability. Uh, this this giant hollow has relatively short arms, but uh, still it has asymmetrical flight feathers along the tail. See, this is a close up of the uh, of one's individual feathers. And uh, even more surprising is another discovery uh, we we. we Another dinosaur we described this year. So it's called a Cai Honglong. 
So this is a beautiful skeleton, just the, the, the head and the body and the tail. So the whole body are covered by feathers. And uh, uh, clearly this dinosaur has different types of feathers, some very simple feathers, some very complex feathers, including asymmetric flat feathers along the tail. But if you look at the arm feathers, arm feathers are like a, like a calypsic feathers. You know, they are pernicious, uh, like, like a uh, kind of very complex feathers, but it has legs uh, asymmetry, which, uh, so, um, simply speaking, the tail feathers of this dancer are uh, asymmetrical, but uh, the arm feathers are symmetrical, so, which is strange. Uh, a story, uh, 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 episode of, uh, about this fossil is also we invested, uh, investigated the possible color of, uh, of this, uh, those plumage. So we use a method actually invented by Jakob Winsor <laughs> sitting here uh, about 10 years ago. And uh, when we look at uh, closely those feathers, we can see some uh, nanostructures, very, very tiny structures, which can be used to predict the colors of uh, extinct dinosaurs and early birds. And uh, this particular dinosaur has a very interesting uh, uh, nanostructure or melanosomes. It is uh, like a distal-like. And those, uh, this type of uh, melanosomes have never, never been seen in other feathery dinosaurs or early birds. Instead, it is seen in some hummingbirds. And the, the presence of this uh, type of uh, 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 melanosomes uh, uh, suggests uh, this dinosaur has uh, like a very bright color over the head and the neck. So as uh, this uh, reconstruction show. So, to summarize those uh, discoveries, so what you have, uh, what you know about uh, the evolution of flight feathers, simply speaking, is that probably uh, the tail feather, uh, I mean, a pernicious feather uh, appeared very early, maybe at the base of a, a group called Panoraptorian, uh, uh, a group including, uh, includes Oraptorosaurs, Denonychosaurs, and birds. And the very first asymmetric flat feathers probably uh, appeared at the base of this group. And then the arm feather, arm feather evolved this uh, uh, asymmetric feature. Uh, so it, it is sort of like the tail first uh, story about uh, these asymmetrical flat feathers. And another type of feathers I want to, to highlight is uh, uh, this kind of like monofilamentous. Uh, so this is a species called Tianyulon. We described this species about 10 years ago, quite a long time ago, uh, in 2009. And uh, you, you can see this is a tiny, small dinosaur. The whole body, nearly the whole body, are covered by very simple structures, the uh, hair-like structures. So this is close-up of the, uh, uh, the hair-like structures. They are mono filaments, very, very simple, like your hairs. For that reason, some people don't believe uh, it is feathers. Number one is too simple, you know, hard to uh, believe it, uh, it is a kind of feathers. Number two, because this uh, structure are present in, in, in a species uh, uh, not nested within a theropod, uh, you know, theropod, uh, birds are nested with theropod. Instead, it is on a siskin dinosaur. So the, totally different lineage. So it's hard for some people to accept that uh, it has any relationship with feathers. But uh, interesting, interest, interestingly, uh, those, uh, the, the mono, <coughs> excuse me, filamentous feathers are not only present in uh, on the siskin uh, dinosaurs, but also in some cerebral dinosaurs, such as the Bapiosaurus. And more interestingly, it, they are present in some pterosaurs. For example, this is uh, a Jeholoposaurus from, uh, from Leonin. So, if, uh, excuse me, uh, if you look at uh, <coughs> those, these pictures, uh, as I said, like uh, uh, many, many fossils that uh, show uh, dinosaurs have feathers. In most cases, you only see those uh, uh, in, in, in cerepos. So, uh, in general, people believe that uh, feathers have origin uh, only within cerebral dinosaurs. But now, uh, 
those fossils indicate that feathers might have a deep origin in, in Acrosauria phylogeny. Uh, even maybe characterize a group including, uh, including both pterosaurs and, uh, and the dinosaurs. That's a big, uh, a bold, I guess, and a, a big conclusion. Uh, so for, for, I, I think uh, not so many people accept uh, that idea, but uh, definitely this is a possibility. Uh, actually, um, more recently, uh, one of uh, my student, actually I'm co a supervisor of this student, uh, made some very interesting uh, observation. And uh, finally, it turned out to be a very interesting project led by uh, Mike Benton and uh, Jiang Baoyu from Nanjing, in uh, Nanjing Insti uh, University. So basically, this student, his name is uh, Yang Zixiao. He made some very interesting observation. But uh, you know, that paper will be published in early next week. I will keep <laughs> that as a secret. I will not mention that discovery today. So you will see news probably early next week about uh, that. Uh, 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 that discovery, and I think that discovery can really, really help you to understand uh, the feather evolution, and uh, it, it, it will be uh, uh, big news. Uh, so for those um, very simple feathers, uh, there are a few other bizarre uh, examples. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, like Bipiosaurus has uh, also has this monofilamentous feathers. And if you look at uh, some fossils of Bipiosaurus, uh, for example, this fossil, it, it, it display a few structures so bizarre. For example, here, this is a tail of Bipiosaurus. You see here, very broad amount of uh, filamentous structures. It's not like a typical, like on the uh, feathers. Uh, similar, but different. And actually, uh, Dala, uh, you know, a few minutes ago, uh, mentioned uh, the, this discovery from uh, uh, Canada. And if you look at this, is on the Mamedi uh, fossil, uh, preserves some uh, interesting uh, impressions, uh, which, are, uh, which probably represent uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, feathers. And uh, those feathers in, in this on the and uh, the, the Bipiosaurus are quite, uh, quite uh, very, very similar. Uh, but uh, they are, uh, what they are is, is still a, a problem because uh, those structures are different from hair-like structures that you see in on the Siskin dinosaurs, but also different from uh, uh, feathers preserved in other, in most other cirrhopods. So what are they? They are incomplete part of some bizarre feathers, or these represent uh, uh, an Euromorph type of feathers we don't know. But anyway, this example shows uh, actually uh, the feather morph types you see in feathered dinosaurs. Uh, are probably very uh, diverse. Uh, it, it's more than we know about uh, the modern feathers. Uh, even more bizarre discovery uh, from feathered lineage is, uh, is a chi of a species we reported a few years ago. And uh, so this species is, is, a, is a very, very bird-like dinosaur. Uh, so uh, analysis suggests it is, a, it is very closely related to bird. So for that reason, you expect uh, this, uh, this dancer has uh, like a uh, modern type of feathers, like, a, like typical flight feathers, but, but, uh, but actually it is not. Uh, if you look at fossils uh, uh, here, this is a chi fossil. The feathers it has are very, very simple. Most surprisingly, it shows uh, some really bizarre structures. For example, there's a rod-like structure near the wrist. And also you see some membrane uh, near the, 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 the arms. So here is a reconstruction uh, showing we have a species near uh, the, the origin of birds which has no uh, flight feathers, uh, uh, like a, has no wings uh, formed by flight feathers. Instead, it's more like a, like pterosaurs or bats, like membrane wings. Uh, see, so is this, this is a speculation uh, how this dinosaur like uh, moved in the air. Of course, uh, as Carl uh, highlighted in this afternoon, uh, there are lots of uncertainties uh, exactly how those extinct species uh, in the local, mo uh, I mean, uh, uh, like uh, uh, behaviors. But anyway, uh, uh, the discoveries show that uh, we do have re some really, really bizarre animals near the origin of birds. Uh, 
to summarize, uh, so those feathers uh, really help us to understand, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, not just the, the feather morphology, also provide impo impo important information about how flight originated. Uh, basically, uh, we, 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 what we can see now is that probably the very first, very first flight uh, appeared quite early, uh, actually before the origin of birds, maybe at the base or near the base of uh, Paniraptoran dinosaurs. And also the early flights are characterized by like uh, many experimental trials. So they, they use like, for example, membrane wings. Sometimes you use leg wings. I didn't uh, uh, highlight uh, in this talk. But uh, if you are interested in this, you can uh, check uh, like work related to Microraptor, related to Anchionis. So many, many uh, early uh, paraavian para dinosaurs actually have what we call leg wings. So, so early flight is quite, uh, quite interesting and uh, experimental and early. Uh, and uh, beneath those flight feathers uh, are some, actually some strangely shaped uh, and kind of ugly bones uh, forming even hand. Actually, actually those uh, ugly bones uh, lead to uh, one famous paradox in evolution biology. Uh, and that uh, paradox uh, actually creates some problems uh, for a time uh, for this uh, dinosaur origin of uh, the dinosaur hypothesis of, of bird, uh, bird origin. Uh, simply speaking, if you look at a uh, fossil record, uh, you have like five fingered uh, dinosaurs and then you have four fingered dinosaurs. And the most uh, uh, bird like dinosaurs have uh, three fingers, just like modern birds. And if you look at the the morphology of those fingers, what you can say is that dinosaur lost their lateral two fingers. So the three finger dinosaur uh, are identified, their fingers are identified as the media three fingers. We call it one, two, three fingers. So this is uh, the, uh, the, 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 the conclusion uh, from the fossil record. But uh, interestingly, Embryological, embryological data from developing birds or, 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 or other animals suggest that uh, modern birds have uh, the middle three fingers, not the media three fingers. So modern birds has like two, three, four fingers. So this is, this is a sort of like a classical debate uh, in, uh, in evolutionary biology. So how to interpret this conflict between the fossil data and the development development data. Uh, there are lots of uh, hypotheses. Uh, one, uh, <coughs> excuse me, one hypothesis is proposed by uh, Wagner and Gaudi in 1999. Basically speaking, uh, simply speaking, this hypothesis suggests that, you know, when we talk about uh, identity of uh, uh, digits, uh, actually, uh, basically there are two types of uh, identities. One is we call a, a position identity. So the identity is based on, like, for example, the position of the fingers. Another type of identity are, we call like a phenotypical identity. So that identity are, are based on, for example, uh, uh, gene expression data, or based on, for, for example, a typical like morphological data. So if you, Normally, if you identify a digit, uh, people believe that the positional identity is consistent with the phenotypical identity. So uh, positional uh, digit, uh, uh, digit one will develop into the phenotypic digit one, and so on. But uh, what uh, uh, those two professors proposed is that actually there's a mismatch between uh, digital identity, uh, positional identity, and uh, phenotypic identity uh, in uh, when a, di a four-finger dinosaur transformed into a three-finger dinosaur. So uh, w w they use a development of a phenomenon we call homoautic transformation to interpret this, uh, this uh, 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 event. And, uh, so I will, uh, like, a, uh, so basically, uh, so there are some uh, uh, gene expression data and uh, some uh, transcriptomic data and uh, some development data. Uh, those data also uh, kind of provide some support for Wagner and uh, Gaudi's uh, 
hypothesis. But uh, for a uh, dinosaur, uh, uh, you know, basically, <coughs> uh, you know, the data uh, this image shows uh, are from here, from living species. Uh, but the event, uh, the real, really, the real evolution event occurred here, uh, deep in the history. So you, if you want to really test this hypothesis, the, of course, the fossils are the best uh, evidence. But, uh, but the problem for that uh, hypothesis is that uh, actually that hypothesis doesn't need any evidence from fossils because it predicts uh, there's a quantum kind of quantum shift of the morphology from a four-finger dinosaur to a three-finger dinosaur. See, so it predicts there's no change of the morphology. So in that case, you just it's not possible to, for you to find any fossils to test that hypothesis. But uh, luckily, we, we, we found some fossils which can be used actually really to test that hypothesis, which is totally unexpected. So those fossils are discovered from another uh, major fossil uh, uh, producing area in China. So this is uh, the fossil site uh, we have been working uh, over the last about 20 years. So, uh, so uh, beginning from about 2000, we, we started this field work uh, in, in, in a, a few sites nearby Tianshan Mountain. So this is a beautiful site, as you can tell. This is called the Mountain of Heaven. Uh, so this project is organized by myself and uh, uh, Jim Clark from uh, George Washington uh, University. So this is a, a, a some uh, team group, uh, team members. From this site, we collected lots of lots of fossils. And some of those fossils uh, were, were already highlighted in a few uh, previous uh, for example, it's Guano, uh, Jurassic Tyrannosaurus. And uh, yes, we, from this site, we found lots of, lots of beautiful fossils. A uh, few examples. For example, this is just a partial neck of a sauropod dinosaur. So you can, you can tell the, how big this, uh, this uh, sauropod is. And from this site, we also found some other interesting fossils, such as uh, a Jurassic Ceratopsian dinosaurs, and also a Jurassic. Uh, uh, I, was, uh, I mean, uh, 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 have a chaos, uh, uh, kind of like a Jurassic ancestor of a modern uh, uh, a very, very bizarre, you know, short armed dinosaurs uh, in, the, in the late uh, Cretaceous. But the most in important discovery, I believe, is this particular fossil, which is called Limosaurus, uh, which provide a, a kind, of, kind of key information to test the hypothesis, uh, the uh, Wagner and the uh, Gaudius hypothesis. Uh, simply speaking, this particular dance has a highly reduced digital one. Uh, this is a bizarre, totally unexpected, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, the previous, all the fossil record of a serapod dinosaur show that uh, 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 general, in general, the serapod dinosaur has a robust digital one. They lost uh, their two lateral fingers. But uh, this dinosaur shows that not all serapod dinosaurs show like a, a sort of like a lateral digital reduction. Instead, some species can have this uh, bilateral digital reduc reduction, which means they lost digit from both sides of the hand, uh, from lateral side, also from the, the middle side. And uh, this discovery pushed us uh, to recheck the hands of uh, many other theropod dinosaurs. And we, after checking some specimens, we noticed uh, an uh, interesting pattern of uh, uh, in, in serapod hands. Uh, simply speaking, which is sort of like this pattern is, uh, if you look at the phalange morphology, yes, you will see uh, like a three-fingered dinosaurs, uh, their three fingers are uh, one, two, three. But if you look at the metacarpal morphologies, uh, they kind of suggest that uh, uh, three fingers of a bird-like dinosaurs have a two, three, four digit. So, kind of different from the signals from uh, fing uh, ph phalanges. Uh, minutes ago, uh, uh, Stephen uh, mentioned that students are very, very good at uh, discovering fossils. I, will, I, I like to add one more sentence. Not, not only they, they are very good at uh, discovering fossils, uh, they are also very good at uh, doing research. And uh, young people learn very fast and uh, they, they are very good at uh, uh, using new methods. So uh, one uh, a student, uh, uh, actually a, a 
Dr. Uh, Jonah Shonian, uh, a professor now uh, at uh, uh, West University of South Africa, uh, a Zen student of uh, Jim Clark. He noticed that there's a, a method that uh, uh, you can use quantitative, quantitatively to test uh, the hypotheses. You know, when we talk about homology, normally we use a qualitative method, right? But uh, uh, Jonah uh, used this uh, method called uh, dynamic homology, uh, n normally used in molecular systematics uh, to test uh, exactly what digits uh, the bird-like uh, dinosaurs have. And uh, so the conclusion is uh, all uh, extinct uh, Tantanuran dinosaurs, uh, they don't have a digit one, two, three as we pre previously believed. Instead, they have a digit two, three, four, just like modern birds. So this, this, this is uh, totally unexpected. And uh, based on the analysis and the fossil and the morphology data, we proposed uh, a hypothesis we call the letter shift hypothesis. Basically, this hypothesis is kind of a modified version of uh, uh, Wagner and uh, Gaudia's hypothesis. Instead of uh, a, uh, a quantum complete uh, homeotic transformation, our hypothesis suggests uh, the homeotic transformation are gradual and partial. And uh, so there are some interesting, uh, uh, like a uh, 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 due to limited time, I will not get into the details, but, but as you can tell, uh, basically the story, uh, the hypothesis suggests that uh, so from uh, like five-finger dinosaur, four-finger dinosaur, three-finger dinosaur, uh, there's uh, some, talk, uh, some interesting thing happened uh, during the transition from four-finger to three-finger dinosaur. And uh, the transition here, as, you, as the color showed, are kind of gradual and incomplete. Uh, so this hypothesis, I believe, uh, get uh, uh, additional support by some recent uh, research. For example, uh, you know, this year there's a, a Wagner's group uh, uh, published, uh, actually I don't know whether it's really published or it's still in print, but uh, basically uh, they, they, they investigate uh, the, the large set of uh, trans transcript uh, transcriptomic data. So basically those data suggest uh, the homeotic change uh, occurred only with the digital one. So the, the gene expression data suggests that the, the, the first finger of a living birth uh, corresponding to a digital one in, 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 in typical tetrapause. But uh, the, the lateral two fingers of living birth uh, corresponding to digit three and four uh, instead of a two, three as they previously believed. So, so in, 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 in short, uh, kind of support over hypo uh, proposal that uh, the transformation is uh, partial, is, is gradual. Maybe not provide evidence for gradual, but at, at least uh, provide evidence uh, supporting a partial transma transformation instead of a complete uh, uh, homeotic transformation. And more interestingly, there are, uh, James Clark's two students, uh, uh, Stegler and Mo, made a even more interesting observation. Uh, they noticed some literature first uh, uh, showing that uh, uh, one feature previously not really uh, noticed by uh, uh, other scientists. Uh, simply speaking, what they noticed is uh, when we talk about uh, digit identity, it's not just about the bones, it's all, also about the soft tissue, like, like muscles and other, other soft tissues. So when bone, when you, for example, when you have a, 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 a finger, some, uh, some, you know, uh, when you have a f five fingers on your hand, you have this kind of like one-to-one -one correspondence between your, your bony structure, your bony part of finger and the, the, your muscle. But when, once you lost some fingers, uh, that kind of correspondence uh, uh, will get very complex. It does not exist. For example, some muscle originally attached to your thumb can move to your uh, digit two. So the muscle and the bony structure can have a mixture of features for finger identity. So that's a very important observation. And they further noticed 
in spherical evolution, there are some uh, structures suggesting this kind of like a mixture of uh, 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 muscle feature and uh, a burning feature uh, occurred also in, uh, in three-fingered dinosaurs. For example, there's a process uh, uh, in uh, the, 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 the thumb, uh, the, the metacarpal one of uh, a three-fingered dinosaur, which are not present in more early branching theropods, suggesting actually uh, maybe those uh, uh, three-fingered dinosaurs use this uh, extra process to receive muscles from the digit one. Uh, um, and uh, they also have <laughs> quite sharp eyes, uh, actually. They notice not only uh, there are some unusual features relate, uh, related to this uh, kind of like a mixture of, uh, of uh, uh, finger features, but also uh, actually living birds never really lost their fifth digit completely. For example, they noticed that in multiple living bird group, still there they are like uh, uh, the fifth digit uh, the, uh, uh, still uh, uh, remain, although they are, they are tiny, sometimes fused with the fourth digit. Uh, this uh, fifth digit is not only present in living birds, they also pr uh, notice this feature are present in some three-fingered dinosaurs and uh, some early birds. So basically, the new data suggest, uh, yes, the, 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 the evolutionary history of the hand evolution is kind of uh, complex. So from the five finger to four finger, finally to three finger, uh, this stage, why the burning structure is, uh, uh, is, 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 is complex, uh, has a complex uh, distribution pattern of features as I just highlighted. Also, uh, the muscle probably shows a complex, uh, muscle features also shows a complex uh, distribution pa pattern. So the three fingers here at the, uh, in, with the Tantanurin dinosaurs uh, are not really the three, uh, like digits one, two, three, or three, two, four. They, they sort of like have a, 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 a different identity uh, from the, like uh, we, we believed before. I, I, what, I, what I want to say is that uh, for the three fingered dinosaurs, uh, their identity is, 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 that is not, they don't have like a, a typical phenotypic identity. They only have like a, a fixed uh, positional identity. So if you want to see, uh, uh, identify like the three fingers of living birds or, or tetanurin serpos, uh, probably it's not a good idea to use a, a phenotypical identity. So this is uh, the data we have. Uh, I mean, the, the data we, we have, and uh, this is uh, what we can say about this uh, uh, evolutionary history of hand. Uh, besides those features, of, of course, this, uh, this, this slide is the highlight. Actually, the, those bird-like features have a, a, a distribution pattern across the whole uh, uh, evolution history of the dinosaur family. And uh, they, they do show uh, very, very complex uh, uh, distrib distribution fat patterns. So uh, simply speaking, I, what I want to say is uh, uh, now we have a lot of new data and those new data help us to solve some problems. But uh, sometimes you see that the, uh, the, the new data also produce more problems, which, which is great. Uh, uh, how to say, uh, basically, the overall understanding of this uh, uh, transition and it is much, much better, but uh, still there, there are lots of things that we don't know very well. Uh, so there's a still a, big, a lot of potential uh, in, in this field. So hopefully uh, students here, uh, who if you are really interested in this topic, uh, yeah, yeah, you can come and talk to me and uh, uh, REPP, you know, I'm based in the institute in Beijing, and we have a, a, a big lab. We are expanding our like uh, research group, and uh, you are welcome to to to, to come to visit and uh, check opportunities there. And uh, for this uh, research topic, of course, there are lots of still lots of uh, as I said, lots of problems. Uh, I will not go into details because uh, probably I, I already uh, passed the time. Uh, Anyway, so thank you for listening.